You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Welcome to Shoe and Show in 2021, Matt. I'm extremely excited to say those words. I don't know about you. Yeah, I'm very excited, Andy. It's amazing that we have made our way all the way through 2020. And um, you know what? It's one of those things where the churn goes on, the struggle goes on. But uh, I'm excited to have a new year ahead of us. And I think the possibilities are more positive than negative and when you look backwards and And so, and compare it with 2020. So I'm excited. I'm excited to have a lot of great conversations this year on Shoe and Show. Yeah, I am too. Um, And I I just want to wish everybody, first of all, Happy New Year, a healthy New Year, um, uh, a huge sales New Year in 2021 compared to 2020. Hopefully that won't be too hard with the comps, um, but also to a better... (laughs) <laughs> um, April, the comp's going to look fantastic. <laughs> uh, but also to a better normal. I know everybody keeps talking about the new normal and things adjust, but I'm hoping for a better normal. Soci- like for society, economically, politically in 2021, back not just to an, a new normal of where we resettle, but I think we have some agency in this world to make positive change. And, and I hope people who are listening – feel positively about the start of the year um, and stay close to FDRA as we continue to work on a number of different issues for the industry, collectively bringing people together. Um, and part of that is this is this podcast, the Footwear Industries podcast. And as we kick off 2021, we really wanted to focus on leaders in the industry, um, sharing insights as they look forward um, and sharing tips and ideas and where their, where their thoughts are as we start the new year. So Matt, keying us up with that, who do we have to kick off this episode? Yeah, Andy, thanks for that. Colin Brown is the chief operating officer at Under Armour, you know, that little uh, Baltimore based in our backyard athletic right. global powerhouse, if you will, and has been a friend of FDRA's for many years and of, of mine as well. And so, Colin, Happy New Year. Thank you for coming on Shoe and Show. We are very excited to have you on. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Nice to uh, nice to get to uh, to talk to you guys. Hopefully we can do it in person at some point in time. Yeah, 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 fingers crossed, right? So my first question, Colin, we ask this often is kind of, what's your shoe story? We know you work for a huge apparel footwear company in Under Armour, and we'll, we'll dive more into kind of the business side. But how on earth did you arrive at your job at Under Armour, and what is your shoe story, if you will? Well, my uh, my guilty secret is that uh, I'm actually a shoe dog when all is said and right. done. Although, although, although I, I'm the COO over here, over here at Under Armour, I'm actually a shoe dog. I uh, I was one of these guys who started my career way back in the 1980s. Um, I, uh, I'm one of these guys who left school at 16 and then went to work in a shoe factory. And this little Swiss company called Bally that had a uh, shoe factory in England. Many of you guys would know Bally shoes, but uh, I was uh, I was a sample boy. My first job at 16 when I uh, when I left school was to chase samples around the factory, and uh, that's kind of what I did. And uh, I was very fortunate within a couple of years uh, at Bali, I kind of went through uh, an, an apprenticeship program that they still had in those days. And uh, I think probably, I think at Bali, I was the last year to actually go through that traditional kind of uh, uh, apprenticeship program. And uh, once I finished that apprenticeship program, and this may, I'm not sure if you even know this, Matt, but uh, I then became a, uh, a heel stylist. My job in, in those days was to design and make uh, ladies high heels. And that was when, in those days when we used to do all out, all out of wood. Wow. So uh, I was a heel stylist for about a, a couple of years, and then I transitioned to become a, a last modelist. So I then used to make all the lasts for Bali. So uh, I was one of these guys that used to go and select your tree, and I used to chop it down, and then I'd whittle the wood until I ended up with the lady's high heel blast. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> so yeah, I was uh, I grew as I like to say I grew up in ladies' high heels. And, uh, your, your shoe dog credentials are the best I've ever heard. Often yeah, I'm, pretty, I, I, I'm, I'm a shoe dog. Serious. 
Well, yeah. I, I hear it. I'm a shoe dog and the guy, you know, did sourcing for a while and that's nice. And that's maybe that's shoe dog, you know, criteria has been met, but yours is, you're like the king of shoe dogs. Well, I'm not sure about that, but I went through, I, it was in those days where you actually was taught to do, I was taught to use every single machine in the factory uh, and cut patterns and all the rest. So I went through, so yeah, they were the days. So uh, that's kind of how I started my career. Right. And uh, I did that for a few years and then, uh, and true story, Bally at the time had a contract with Cathay Pacific, and I'm not sure if you remember it, but in those days, a lot of the airlines used to have designer kind of uh, uniforms mm-hmm. for, their, for their stewards and stewardesses. And uh, I was sent to Hong Kong to uh, to measure Cathay Pacific uh, flight crews and design a range of shoes in multiple different fittings because, remember, you know, these lots of different fittings and feet expand when you fly uh, as well. And uh, so I was sent there to measure all of these air hostesses, which was a tough job, let's be honest. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I uh, and while I was there uh, designing this range of shoes for for Cathay Pacific, I bumped into uh, uh, somebody from this small company. This was in the late eighties from this small small company called Reebok, and mm. uh, they expressed an interest in what I was doing and uh, asked if I really wanted to go back to my provincial town in uh, my provincial city in England and. Uh, would I like to move to Busan in South Korea? So I upped and moved to Busan in South Korea in about 1988 and uh, then proceeded to kind of uh, work for Reebok for 10 years, bouncing around various different countries um, and in technical roles and then in production roles and then in various different roles for Reebok from everything from um, everything from uh, I was head of quality for a while for Reebok. I even did human rights when it first kind of kicked off. So I kind of did a little bit of everything and ended up working in, uh, in Korea. Uh, I then ended up spending four years in China in 91, which was an interesting time to be there I in the Philippines for three years and then in Thailand for about another four years. But after working for Reebok, uh, while I was working for Reebok, I also started to dabble in apparel. So I kind of started to get a little bit involved in that when I, mean, I was country manager. But then in the late, like late 90s, if you remember, the Asian crisis meant that a lot of factories, uh, so a lot of Thai factories were yeah. going bankrupt. And I ended up, I ended up uh, uh, being approached by the Bank of Thailand to go and run a company group called Wong Pai Tun, which was a big factory group in Thailand in those days. And uh, I actually ran uh, that factory group in Thailand, making shoes for Reebok and for Nike for four years. So... Uh, so yeah, my, my shoe experience is, is, is pretty deep. Uh, and then from there on, I then ended up doing various things in, uh, in, uh, in both apparel and footwear. I ran a private label company, but what used to be the old Pentland shoe, ASCO, for a number of years for mm-hmm. Pentland Group, which was the big private label business that came into the UK. So, uh, and then from there, it was, uh, it was a little bit, uh, had a year at Lian Fung and then, uh, between VF, um, obviously, I joined VF to look up to run primarily their footwear business at the time, their footwear sourcing business, and then on to Under Armour. So, uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, if, if you cut me, I, I bleed shoe dog. <laughs> now I see why you and Mike Jepson get along so well because it sounds like a very similar background. It is. My, Mike and I go way, way back. So yeah. I think I'm not sure. When, it must be probably the early '90s we go back to. So uh, yeah, we've chased each other around this industry for a long time, and he's a he's a great guy. I love Mike. Now, okay, so let's let's take your experience, Colin, and now talk about current day, right? So you've been you used to chase samples around as a as a, a boy in the factory, and now you're the chief operating officer of Under Armour, a global, a huge global athletic apparel and footwear brand. How is the job different, and how is it super <laughs> similar? <laughs> Do you know what? There's probably more similarities than there are differences. Actually, it's funny, isn't it? You know, okay, I'm not, I'm not kind of, but so much of it. One of the, one of the lessons I learned, perhaps in those early days walking the factory floor, was it really is all about people. You know, so much of what we do is is really trying to engage people and get, getting people to kind of understand the vision and where you want to, how you want to move things forward. And, and actually, that's the kind of the, you. you I guess you employ similar kind of uh, models for when you're asking somebody to figure out how to make, would they please stop their, their piece rate work? And can I sign them off so they can do my samples? And it's the same thing. Can I kind of inspire my team to actually kind of deliver what we need to do for Under Armour as well? So in many respects, it's very similar. You know, it's a lot of the same things. I, I say to my kids, you know, so much of it, success is not a, uh, a singular game. It all is about teamwork. And, uh, you know, so from that point of view, it was very similar. Hey, Colin, I want to, I want to get into that because I think it's extremely important that we focus on 
uh, the footwear workers right now who are a, a lot of them working remotely, um, you know, in, in ways that we haven't seen uh, in, in ever uh, in 2020. And as we start to see vaccines start to roll out and we start to, to have those conversations about coming back in office and um, and maybe not coming back in office, how do you how do you provide leadership in those spaces? Is it, is it similar as, you know, in terms of being in the office uh, as being on a Zoom call, do you find, or are there other challenges or opportunities with this kind of a remote, this remote working world that we have now in terms of leading and guiding and managing our, our workforce? Uh, I think it's obviously very different and it requires a, a, a slightly different kind of approach, you know, and I, first of all, I have to commend everyone for kind of how well we've been able to pivot to this kind of model and to, to kind of managing our businesses or managing our departments or doing what we do from our, you know, kitchen tables and back bed, bedrooms. But the fact that we've been able to do that is, is, is actually frankly kind of amazing, but, uh, you know, it does require a different approach. You know, you, you do have to up your level of communication, uh, significantly. Uh, I also think you you have to be uh, you have to make a point of building those personal connections when you kick off conference calls when you kick off discussions mm-hmm. and it's one of the things I always try and do is is just check in with people make sure people are okay make sure that things are all right you know if, if we're doing a what if we're doing a, a, a visual call then kind of just call out what's going on and, and and actually take that extra moment just to make sure you're building those relationships in because, you know, they're the things that will carry you through the tough times. It's the fact that, you know, you can rely on people because you've got that kind of commonality, uh, those common ground and those common values in place. So it's important to reinforce those things even on, even more so when you don't have the same physical cues that you would have if you were working in person. So yeah, it's, it's different, but in some respects it's better. I mean, it, it, it forces us to finish meetings on time and start meetings right. on time and, and yeah, that kind of thing. There, there's some upsides to it as well. Right. And I, I think you're dead on, I mean, uh, relationships matter a great deal in this environment. And I, and I think the other thing too is, is in some ways it's over communicating, right? Constantly reinforcing that communication again and again and again to make sure that everybody is on cue and, and, and um, working, working towards those goals and North stars. Um, let me, let me ask you a bit about, as you see 2021, you know, as you look at the economic environment that we have in the U S obviously there's stimulus checks that have been going out. There's possibility that more may come. Um, you know, how do you see 2021 in terms of consumer spending and consumer confidence and, um, where do where do you see the marketplace going in 2021? Are we going to be okay? Or are we going to be similar to what we had last year? Um, are we going to have huge efficiencies? Um, what what do you see in the marketplace right now going forward? Well, you know, I, I like that old that old kind of comment that Winston Churchill had. You know, this is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end, but it may just be the end of the beginning. And I think yeah. that's kind of where we are at the moment. We're at the end of the beginning. Um, and I think we will we, we will continue to see things pick up as as we get more uh, stability uh, across the uh, the economy, and uh, and we'll we'll end up with an element of confidence coming back. But I don't think we're going to go back to where we were. I think you know economically there may be opportunities for us to engage with consumers differently. But uh, you know it's going to be a different world when we come out of this. We're not going to go back to exactly where we were historically. Yeah. But I'm. I, but at the same time, I. I genuinely believe that this is actually a huge opportunity, not just for our industry, but for for the global economy uh, altogether. Pro- productivity had kind of slowed over the last kind of 10, 20 years. We hadn't really seen this 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 uh, panacea of of value that was going to come out of uh, you know technology and uh, AI and all this other kind of stuff. But I think now there is an opportunity for that to happen. And if if you look back historically. After there's been any type of significant crisis or uh, quite often there's kind of a decade of renewal when things reset and we have the opportunity to kind of reconfigure how we drive the world. And, you know, you only have to look at the excitement and the energy that came in the 1920s. Uh, you know the whole Art Nouveau movement, the uh, and everything else that came along with that after the after the First World War and the, the halcyon days of the U.S. in the 1950s, and you know th- there is a reason I think that those things happen because people realize there is a different way of doing things and you can accelerate. You you've got and I liked your comment earl- earlier, Andy, which I wrote down. You, we've got an agency now to, that should that allows us to do things differently, and I I, I think we may see we're going to come out of this stronger. I think we may see, see things like productivity and other things actually increase because if you think how 
if you think of our ability to change, this pandemic uh, and what we've been through has demonstrated just how well we are able to do that. You know, the fact that we are able to manage our businesses from the kitchen tables. Now, I'm, if, I think retail in the U.S. grew, e-commerce retail grew more in five years than, than in, in eight weeks than it did in five years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the fact that we can pivot that quickly. Now, can you imagine if we'd have tried to architect that, if we'd have tried to work right. through those businesses, how are we going to get every, how are we going to get everyone to work from home? We'd have had 300 page Gantt charts and everything else and <laughs> systems upgrades, but we just pivoted to it. It shows that we can adapt, we can drive and we can double down. And so I'm, I'm actually incredibly enthusiastic. I think that next year is going to be bumpy. Uh, it's going to be, you know, three steps forward and two steps back. But I think once we come out of this, once we get into 2022 and beyond, we're going to, we, we potentially can see a, uh, an incredibly bright future. I love this conversation because I, I think you're exact. I read something the other day about productivity and they, they were going through the same historical wow. analysis of where we hit the 90s. We had a huge technology boom with computers. And then somewhere in the 2000s, it just kind of puttered along in terms of, of output per worker. And so if you're measuring, and I, I think there was something in a book I read where they're measuring like kitchen, kitchen innovations, right? How does, how do products make our lives better? Where are the innovations where, you know, we haven't seen a new type of oven or a new microwave or a, or a new refrigerator that's changed our, our, our ways fundamentally for, for decades at this point. And I think you're exactly right. Now we've kind of stripped off this, maybe a little fear, maybe a little rust, um, and now we, we, you know, we've all, we've always had these technologies that have been sitting around that just kind of went half used or unused. And now that we're, we're using them. And I think now that we're using those, maybe we've un, unchained our minds a little bit to say, what else could we start to put in to optimize our businesses? Right. So as you guys look at that, what are, you know, are you guys using more software than you ever have before to, to, to look at, you know, you're talking about sampling earlier by hand and chopping down trees, like digitization. Are you guys investing more in that and looking more in that? But also just, you know, in terms of, I don't know, I, I'm wondering how much wisdom are we getting out of our data from the consumer stuff? Now that we got these e-commerce and we've got direct to consumer, are we capturing a lot of data and, and are we are we being wise with that data? Are we getting all that we really want out of it? I don't know what you think about that and, and how you guys look at that. Uh, we're capturing far more data than we're actually able to use, and that's. Yes. And, and, but that's possibly okay. Right. One of the things, one of the conversations I've been having with teams here is, you know, if we wait until we've got all the data, we, we're we're going to be waiting forever. We're never right. going right. to get all the data. There's always going to be an an, an explosion of data out there. It's going to continue to grow. That's not going to change. We have to really understand what data we need that is going to allow us to make better informed decisions. And so it's really being uh, strategic and, and understanding where data adds value and what data you can use to kind of better drive your business. Right. And to me, you know, that's, that's one of the big opportunities that we have as we come out of this, as we start to think about e-commerce, how do we actually use the data and the information we have out there to, to guide us to make much better decisions with regards to how we run our businesses? You know, I, I always use the, I, I always kind of say the, 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 one of the reasons why we, we all clap us, we all slap ourselves on the, on the, the back for managing our inventory and we've got our inventory down to, you know, 90 days. 90 days is, is three months worth of inventory. Right. That, 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 that makes no sense. Your three months worth of inventory is crazy. You, none of you, I hope, have three months worth of breakfast cereal in your kitchen. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. We, we built this three months worth of inventory because we don't know, because we've had to, we bought products from so far overseas. We don't actually know what the consumer wants. So we just buy this large chunk of stuff and store it in a warehouse and hope people calls it off. Data should allow us to change the way we think about that and, mm. uh, and, and really get much more, uh, 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 much more detailed in the way in which we kind of think through that. And so there's huge opportunities around all of that. Yeah. Yeah, there are. I mean, there's, I think the sky's the limit, Colin, when it comes to, um, to the opportunities around data. And I, I, I'm really kind of glomming on to your optimism. It's a great way to start, start the day for sure. So Colin, one of the things that, um, I'm kind of glomming on to is the optimism that you have for the future. It's something that I think all of us need right now. And I think there are a lot of different silver linings out there that we can point to. Um, you talked about inventory that, that is such a challenge. I think that is one of the, there's an art, I always call inventory the great art and not a science of, of, of the footwear industry and part of the, the 
probably the broader consumer industry, if you will. Um, how are you managing or thinking about inventory management during COVID as we continue on in 21? And then what can we do in 22 and beyond that will allow us to be more effective as it comes to inventory control? Well, I think we, we, as I mentioned kind of earlier, I think we just really now have to, we, we have an ability to use data to better understand demand. And therefore, it allows us to think very differently with regards to what inventory we need to hold in order to fulfill kind of the consumer's, uh, uh, consumer's expectations. But at the same time, um, you know, I think it means we, we also need to look at how we manage the back end of the house and the, you know, the factory relationships and where we source product from and think through how that kind of aligns better. But I think that's the big shift I think that's happening. Historically, I think if you look at certainly, you know, what supply chains have done and what the sourcing organizations have done, we've always historically been, um, fa- we've always been backward facing. We've always looked back at the factories and, and, and that side of the business is where we kind of drive value. And in, in the 1980s and 1990s, when China was the factory of the world, then that kind of made sense. And you could see why there'd be some value to that because you could always go to another country and find a lower FOB. But today, because of the way the, the way in which you're seeing kind of a, a much more level playing field from the point of view of, of, of uh, uh, costing in, across multiple different countries, the value really has to be at the front end. So I think from a supply chain point of view, and, uh, and we really need to shift our focus from worrying too much about the back end and factory relationships. They're still going to be incredibly important, and we need to have strategic relationships we can rely on. But really, the value that we can bring as a brand is understanding the demand, the front end of it, so that the supply chain becomes a driver of revenue and not necessarily a manager of cost. And that's kind of the shift I think we're seeing that will play out as we really start to kind of get that data. And as we start to think about that, then that will manifest itself in how we kind of show up, uh, our inventory shows up and how we manage inventory. Because to your point, at the moment, it doesn't make, uh, it's, it's a bit of an art and it shouldn't be. With the data we have out there now, it should be much more of a science. Well, how do you do that, Colin, in a world that's so tum- so tumultuous right now when it comes to trade and uh, you know th- additional duties and threats of additional duties and uncertainty? Is it even more? Are we in a more difficult environment in spite of the data we have on the consumer side? Are we in a more difficult environment to manage the back end and make it less of a cost structure or, co- or cost impact? Yeah, we are. It, it it makes it more challenging, but you know, I I kind of welcome that because this is when the, when the good get going. You know, this is when right, right. those of us are good at what we do kind of can can win in these days. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think remember we make money from what we sell, uh, from what we sell things for, not necessarily from what we buy them for. So it, again, it has to be much more focused on understanding how we can maximize the, the the margin at the front end of the business and and minimize our cost but maximizing kind of the the, the margin at the front end of the business minimizing our write downs at the end of the season managing our reducing our liquidation uh, you know reducing what we actually have to hold in inventory if you actually sit and do the maths if, if you know if the the members sit and do the maths of how much it costs us for write downs at the end of the season how much it costs us to hold our inventory the value of the inventory we have in the cash flow everything else you know managing managing that front end well actually the, the, there's much greater value in that now than there is actually in, in getting too hung up on the back end. Now you do have to manage the back end, of course, and it is getting more complicated with duties and tariffs and all that other stuff that we're dealing with. But to me, the, the value is really about getting at that front end. I think I think that's a fan. I, I, it's just fascinating to hear you talk about that because one of the big things I'm I'm wondering about 2021, Colin, is um, you know in terms of channels, we see this whole thing, this movement direct to consumer to have your own websites and deliver direct and are we are we in a, a moment where brands and companies should think about going back to core and reducing channels, or should they be expanding their channels and trying to find new outlets, uh, new partners, new new stores to sell, sell their shoes to? What in this environment when we're trying to recalculate everything, do we expand our channels or do we do we contract them a bit to try to control them more? You start with the consumer, Andy. You got to go where the consumer goes. You've got to meet the consumer where he wants to engage with you. And so I think the answer is different for, for each and every business, as it probably should be. Uh, 
because you know it depends upon you, you, the demographic of your consumer and and how and how you your relationship with your consumer and how you're building that relationship and what relationship do you want to build with them you know having a direct relationship is obviously you have more control over that than if you're necessarily doing it through a wholesale partner but you know wholesale partners also bring value because of the way in which they can offer a broader assumption of brands uh, uh, assortment of brands within their kind of portfolio that you can play off but so i think it really it really comes down to how do you want to build that relationship with the consumer that you have for your business i think that's a fantastic answer to that question that uh I think that's dead on because I, I think so oftentimes we focus so much on the data and the operations and and if you boil it down to just the consumer and to what you said at the beginning, relationships. Um, if you okay. focus on consumers and relationships, you're going to win in this environment. So um, so I think you're dead on with that. Um, and I know our time's drawing uh, near to the end. I did, Andy, I, did just want, I did just want to add one other thing, and I think this is something that the, the, the FDRA can really help us lean into and understand is – now, if, if we are optimistic, if we feel there is a huge opportunity for us to build a better world, we, we do have a responsibility, I think, as an association and as an industry to try and architect that somewhat from the point of view of what it means for the workers in our in our industry, what it means for sustainability, what it means for, you know, all those different aspects from the point of view of how do we make life and this planet better for the, the individuals that inhabit it. So I think that's one of the things that I, I need to thank you guys for kind of leaning into and to just ask you and our members to double down. Down on. We have an opportunity to to come out of this stronger, but only if we commit to making sure that that happens. Uh, that's well said. Well said, yeah. well said. And and to those out there listening, FDRA.org is our website. Uh, you can go to that. You can get involved. We have a, a multitude of events for professional development, training, education, best practices and tips to help everybody do their jobs better. Um, but also our members have the opportunity to join working group calls so that we can work together on common issues like sustainability, um, like intellectual property issues and brand protection, um, like understanding sourcing shifts and supply chain challenges that we all face together. We all compete uh, in the marketplace, but we all have the same similar challenges in the back room. And if we can work together, we can increase impact and lower costs. So, so Colin, thank you for that note. Um, so, so important. Um, Jasmine, I want to bring you in now uh, before we, uh, before we tail off on the show to, uh, to do your one of your world famous uh, is it fashion footwear? Is it what you got? What you getting? What are we doing today? So we are doing what you got? What you getting today? All right. Um, Colin, that is where we share what we're wearing currently um, and what shoes we are hoping to get. Um, and what's funny is that I've actually been wearing my Under Armour running shoes, my Phantom running shoes um, most recently because they're just slide ons. I've been looking for like, I, of course, I've invested in slippers since we've been at home, uh, but I'm in really enjoying the shoes that I can easily slip on to go to the grocery store, to the post office. So I have been really enjoying those. Right, love that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're very comfortable. I do use them to work out, but I haven't as much recently, so they're my, my Aaron shoes right now. Um, but I think I'm looking to get maybe a pair of Doc Martin, some else that might be a little easy for me to slip on, not sure, but I'm just looking for some other shoes in that same kind of category that I don't always have to lace up. So no, you, you, can't, you can't beat a pair of dogs. I tell you, a nice pair of <laughs> black dog muffins, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so what about you, Colin? What you got on um, and what are you looking to get? All right. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here at home, so I ain't wearing any shoes at the moment. I'm not a slipper guy. I'm a... Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I don't wear slippers around the house. I, uh, I'm, I, having spent 20 years in Asia, I kind of, uh, we don't, I don't wear shoes around the house. But uh, obviously, working for Under Armour, I'm, I'm, I love what we've done in footwear over the past four or five years. We've done some great stuff. One of the, one of my favorite shoes at the moment is we, we, we put out a new range of fat tires. And I know Matt has got a pair of the fat tire boots. I remember him seeing them. I do. Blue awesome. pants. Remember Matt? I do. And uh, I've got the new version that came out. And I think they've already sold out. I've got the new version that came out, which are just slip-ons, which are great. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're ugly good looking. You know, they're one of the shoes that... <laughs> 
which I just like. You know, they 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 they're pretty cool. They and Cybermark. Uh, Any, anything that sells is not ugly. That's the rule of thumb. If they if they sell, true. then they're not ugly. Yeah, but you know what I mean. They're they're, they're <laughs> ugly in that bad kind of way. You know. Right. Uh, so they're good. I'm uh, I'm obviously putting a lot of miles in my Under Armour uh, uh, machinas, my, my my hover shoes from Under Armour. So I'm doing a lot of miles on those. Um, what else am I uh, looking forward to? I got a new pair of Hunter Wellies for Christmas. Um, so uh, where I live here in the UK is in, literally in the middle of a field. So uh, got lots of dog walks and this type of stuff. So I'm enjoying those. The one thing I need to get is I need to get, you know, I'm, I, I, I love good shoes. You know, you can't do, you know, I, I'm, I <laughs> it always looks at people's shoes to see what they're wearing. And the one thing yeah. I need to do is I, I need to upgrade to another good pair of uh, English brogues. You know, I, I think every, everyone needs to have in their wardrobe a good, solid pair of English brogues. And finally, the, the other thing I need to replace is I need to replace my pair of black Chelsea boots. Oh, man. You are, I've never had someone say they're going to, you know, list out five pairs they're going to get. That's awesome. I tell you, no, I tell you, it's all about shoes, guys. I tell you, it's love language. That's Matt's love language. It is my love language. <laughs> totally. Um, now, I'll, now I'll go next um, before Colin throws another five pair on the um, <laughs> I am currently in a total move to uh, to uh, to butt to butt kiss. I guess I should say I'm wearing my Curry Seven basketball shoes that Cam hooked me up with. They're black colorway with some with some red, some good NC State colors. And um, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to tell you not what I'm going to get. I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to get. I'm not. And when Andy mentioned intellectual property, it got me re- remembering about Uncle Martian footwear. I'm not going to oh. get me ever a pair of Uncle Martian shoes, the, the Under Armour knockoffs in China. I think that was in, in Fujian province that they un- unveiled that. So I will I'd never not. Speak you, I'd I'm never speak to you again, Matt, if I knew you were buying those. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Martian? Yeah, they ripped off under. In fact, they ripped off even someone told me this. You have like this, um, and I can't remember which player, but one of your original athletes is a statue of him in the canteen. They, they, they ripped the entire thing off. Yeah, they they, yeah. they went big time. I think we, we 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 sorted that out in the end, though it took a couple of years as these things do. But uh, yeah, it was a pretty significant rip off. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, I will not be getting Uncle Martian. Oh, there you go. No Uncle Martians. That's uh, it, you know how it's, it's crazy how those guys come up with so much stuff um, and get away with it. And I'm glad that we're starting to see more and more brands work together to push back as a whole um, because it's just it's just too much. There's so many workers out there doing so much hard work and being so creative with their ideas um, and, and being so innovative and so much blood, sweat and tears going into it. Maybe not chopping down trees, but uh, but still, you know, uh it's crazy that that somebody can come along and just do that. So so good on you guys for fighting against that and, and winning. But it's it's incumbent upon all of us to be more vigilant um, and as consumers as well um, from what we purchase and where we purchase it from to be thoughtful about that. So, hey, Andy, just before we go, I do have to say that as an American, and I'm reading, currently reading 1776 by David McAuliffe. Funnily uh, enough, I just finished that a couple months ago. Oh, really? The yeah, irony yeah. that a British guy – a British shoe guy is now going to have a, the myth of chopping down trees like George Washington. <laughs> uh, this is unbelievable. It's a good book, by the way. Great book. Uh, it's a great book. I'm sure it wasn't a cherry tree. <laughs> no, it wasn't. That's all right. We'll say it was uh, just for the mythology of it. So exactly. Colin, thank you so much for, for talking with us today and taking the time and kind of opening the door to, to, to your thoughts uh, for 2021 and being so optimistic about things. Really appreciate it and appreciate your leadership in our industry. No, thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank you to the uh, FDRA, Matt, and all of you guys, Andy, everything that you guys do. Thank you. We appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you, folks. This is Shoe and Show. This is your podcast, the Footwear Industries Podcast, coming out every single Monday morning. Um, please go to shoeandshow.com. You can see our entire catalog, which is more than 200 shows now. And I know as we keep going through this, these massive changes, there's still a lot of shows that are still relevant. Um, a lot of our executives, their insights into leadership, into management, 
um, are all still on there and still very relevant and still very helpful. Um, so please go back through there if, if you're uh, if you're sitting at home and you're looking for something to do. Um, and and please subscribe. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on uh, Spotify. We're on every single platform out there. So you can join us every single week. We consider this kind of our kitchen table, if you will, as we sit at our kitchen tables doing this now, um, where we have conversations with leaders in the industry about what's happening so that everybody can get a little bit better at their job and find new ideas and insights. So uh, with that, we thank everybody for listening. Drop us a line if you have ideas for future shows, for topics, for guests, etc. But again, thank you as always for listening. And until next time, Shoein is out. Shoein has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.